Ladies and gentlemen, what color is a mirror? That's a question that came up recently when I was playing a game. That's this game right here from the Spiral Reignited Trilogy. Well, I was looking at this fancy reflective material in the scene and that's what prompted the question. More on this later. Today's topic is reflection maps. We're taking a look at the world of computer graphics and how exactly are we able to, well, achieve the effect of reflections in a 3D scene and do it in a way that makes sense without being too computationally expensive. Let's start with one of the more straightforward methods, which is ray tracing, a term that has gained a lot of, well, interest these days. Ray tracing is one of the most straightforward ways of achieving lighting effects like reflections and other things, from shadows to refractions and soft lighting and so on. Essentially, how ray tracing works is, well, it attempts to emulate what light is actually doing in the real world. Here's what I mean by that. In the world of ray tracing, what we do is, well, we trace the path of light rays. How we do that is we essentially fire rays of light out from the camera that go into the 3D scene and what they're trying to do is they're trying to hit a surface and sample a color. That's the idea. You can imagine that if we were to do this once for every pixel in the image, then we have a rendered image. That's the idea. So where do reflections come into play? Simple. All we have to do when we are sending out those rays and it hits a reflective surface is that the rays bounce. When they hit the surface, they bounce off, they go elsewhere to try and find a color to sample. We are glossing over quite a few details about ray tracing itself. One of the big things about ray tracing is, of course, there are lights in a 3D scene. And as those lights change and move around, the scene changes as well. So when we normally do ray tracing, we of course trace all the way back to a light source. It's essentially the light path, but in reverse. Also typically in ray tracing, well, light bounces everywhere. What we've seen just now is just one bounce for our reflective scene, but in the real world, you would expect there to be more bounces for more purposes, be it to gather shadows, to have indirect lighting, and so on. And well, this is ray tracing. You're seeing the Blender 3D program, my favorite 3D program, actually doing ray tracing in eh, close to real time. As you can see, it's not that quick. If you're noticing that it takes a while for the effect to actually settle in, that's because, yeah, that is indeed what's going on. The problem is ray tracing is slow. Now, I know we are in the advent of real-time ray tracing and that is quite miraculous in and of itself, but even that has to cut some corners. It's not really what we consider full-blown ray tracing in the sense that, well, it still doesn't go through the entire emulation of what light would actually do in the real world. The full-blown non-real-time ray tracing that, say, they use in movies and such, that stuff can be very computationally intensive, and we're definitely not just sending one ray per pixel. Usually, multi-sampling is involved, that is potentially multiple rays per pixel so that they can go out and collect more light from the environment, and each time there is a bounce, we might also end up generating more rays. This is particularly evident in places like soft shadows where, well, we have to have multiple samples from the environment before we can properly emulate the effect. So unfortunately, that's one problem with ray tracing. But having said that, it also can have many interesting advantages. One big advantage about ray tracing is that it is physically accurate. At least if you're talking about ray tracing strategies that actually respect how light works in the real world. One effect I absolutely love when that happens is caustics, which you can see on screen here. These little patterns that come out from light actually refracting through the glass material over here, that's called caustics, and that's actually really pretty. This was also done in Blender, but the default Blender renderer, which is called Cycles, actually doesn't support this. I had to download a separate renderer called LuxCore that, well, actually did this magic. So, well, it's important to note that not all ray tracing renderers are built the same. If they do the math a little bit differently, if they choose to cut corners, then the effect you're going to see at the end of the day is also going to be slightly different. Anyway, let's take it that ray tracing operations that are faithful to, well, how physics in the real world actually works is slow. So let's try and find a better way to do reflections. 
If you think about what ray tracing is really trying to achieve, well, it's really just going out into the environment to try and find other colors from the environment to paint on the surface of the reflective object. What this means is a possible shortcut that we can take is to just, well, take note of what that environment is like before we start doing our rendering, and that will save us a few bounces later on. Let's say we got a 3D scene that looks something like this, and I know I want to place a reflective object into the scene. Well, here's what I could do beforehand. I could first take a look at the entire environment and go, well, why don't I capture a 360 degree panorama of that environment in every direction? If you think about it, that gives us all the information we need to create a reflective object. And yeah, that's basically how it works. The reflection you're seeing right here is calculated from a reflection map of the surroundings of, well, this little pavilion scene. Do take note, it's not exactly the same picture as I've shown you previously, but the concept works the same. It's essentially just taking note of the scene once and then reusing it in real time. This, by the way, is using Blender's EV renderer, which is meant to work in real time. But yeah, it's just easier because we're no longer computing how light actually interacts with the environment. All we need to do is to find out which pixels are in the way of whichever surface on the mesh. Then all we have to do is to go to the image, read off the relevant pixels, and there you go, you have your reflection. Of course, that's not to say this technique is without any disadvantages. Take a look at what happens if I try to modify the scene. Uh oh, well, things don't look quite right now. Yes, because the reflection map comes from a static scene, any changes to the physical scene will not, well, for lack of a better word, be reflected in the mesh that is actually reflective. So that's the disadvantage. So just like ray tracing, reflection mapping has its pros and cons. The pros is that it is very, very fast. You can compute it once and reuse it in whatever context you like at essentially no additional computational cost. But of course, the disadvantage is, yeah, you only compute it once. Unless the scene was perfectly static, you're not going to be able to capture any changes in the scene, unless of course, you redo the reflection map. So of course, the question is, when do we actually want to use reflection maps? Well, there are a few times in which it makes more sense. For example, if we know for sure that the scene is static. Or if we know that reflections are blurry. Well, you've seen this graphic a couple of times. You'll notice that we can recognize that it is a reflective surface, but you're not explicitly seeing a scene very clearly. That's when it's a rougher surface, you have a blurrier reflection, that's when you can get away with, well, slightly imprecise reflections. Apart from that, if you really need speed, then perhaps you may have to give up a little bit of quality. Or the final alternative is the more interesting one. If you're going to be using a combination of strategies to achieve a reflective effect. Here, let me give you one example of that in action. What you're seeing here is the same scene from before, but as you can see, I can now move objects around and, well, we can still see the reflections quite nicely. This is the same scene as before. What you realize is that the reflection looks okay. As I move the items around, the changes are reflected. And if you look closely, you'll realize that the reflections kind of happen at two different qualities. Moving the objects around, you can see that their reflections are slightly rougher and at some times they go missing entirely, whereas the roof of the little pavilion area looks perfect. Turns out there is a reflection map on top of other calculation strategies, which I believe are based on ray tracing. If I were to delete the reflection map, you can see that the screen space reflections, you know, the other strategy, they don't look that great and items are entirely missing at some times. But yeah, that is one example of combining reflection maps with other techniques. But I want to touch on one last topic before I let you go. And that is the notion of environment maps. What if you want that reflective look, but you want to actually create a realistic scene that, well, draws upon real world imagery? Well, you can do that. If your panorama comes from a real world 360 photograph, then yeah, the effect works exactly as you imagined. The reflective surfaces now take upon that real world scene and yeah, it looks like it was an object in the real world. So an environment map is a pretty cool strategy to achieve reflections as well. 
Of course, environment maps are used for other things as well. Usually when people capture real world environment maps, it's captured in HDR, high dynamic range. And in doing so, we have a very good idea of which parts of the scene are bright, which parts of the scene are in shadow, and that can even be used for lighting a 3D scene. So we get real world lighting into our fake 3D scene. That makes it easy for you to, well, create something in 3D and then mix it with real world footage, for example. So now that we are familiar with the idea of environment maps, we can come back to this video game capture. As you can probably put together by now, the color of a mirror is just that of its surroundings. Except, if you look carefully at this capture, that's not the surroundings at all. Seriously, take a closer look, it's not the same environment, you don't see anything being reflected from the environment itself, I mean, you don't see the main character, nothing, right? As long as the color is vaguely correct, as long as it moves in a way that is vaguely correct, that's more than enough to trick your brain. So what color is a mirror? Well, turns out it doesn't really matter. As long as it behaves the way you think a mirror is supposed to behave, I suppose it's a mirror. That's all there is for this episode. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video and are feeling generous, a donation to this channel will be greatly appreciated. There's a link on screen and in the video description for more details. Meanwhile, please do like, comment, and subscribe. This helps the channel tremendously and gives me the means to do more. Thank you once again, and I'll see you next time.